So welcome to this episode of Finding Your Range podcast with me, Jeannie Debon. This is the podcast that looks at EDS, hypermobility and chronic pain. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Philip Ball, who is a consultant rheumatologist. So welcome, Dr. Ball, for joining us today. Really delighted to have you here. So um, those of you who don't know Dr. Ball, um, I'm just going to read you his bio. And then today's a little bit different because we're actually going to be looking at some slides, um, um, which we haven't done before. But um, we've got some really interesting work that um, Dr. Ball's been looking at on long COVID as well, which we're going to get to in a little while. So let's just hear about Dr. Ball. So he's a consultant rheumatologist, joint hypermobility specialist, mindfulness champion, and a bass guitar player. And you might see the guitar in the background there that gives that away a little bit. Um, since retiring full-time from the NHS in 2014, he holds the current positions. So he's a consultant rheumatologist at the One Hospital in Ashford. He's a senior lecturer at GKT Medical School, and he's the lead medical advisor at the HMSA, which is the Hypermobility Syndromes Association. He has also been involved in education for medical students from Guy's, King's, and St. Thomas's Medical Schools, junior doctors and GPs in East Kent. Dr. Ball's main speciality interest is joint hypermobility syndromes. He is the instigator of the Kent Hypermobility Network, now known as the HMSA Education Model, which is what we're gonna just have a quick look at now. And he works with the HMSA charity to improve services for hypermobile patients through education using existing resources. His other interests include gout, soft tissue rheumatism, fibromyalgia, and chronic pain. So thank you again for joining us and welcome to the podcast, Dr. Ball. Thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to start off just by talking to you about the, the education model, uh, yeah. which has been running for five years in Kent. And it's all about uh, improving uh, understanding and services for patients with hypermobility syndrome through education, yeah. using existing resources, that's important. And we provide education material, which is available on the, on the website. Um, and it's based on the Kent model, but we've renamed it uh, the HMSA education model. And the point yeah. about this model uh, is that uh, it's transferable and adaptable from county to county uh, using the guidance that we have on our HMSA website. Important to understand yeah. that it's an unfolding situation. What I'm showing you is just a summary of work in progress. Um, but what we're trying to do is facilitate best practice management in primary care, which is um, really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. uh, to achieve early diagnosis, we know how important that is. And to help rheumatologists feel confident in making a diagnosis and being able to outline a care plan for complex patients and to signpost appropriately. And uh, furthermore, uh, develop uh, therapy expertise uh, in hypermobility and making good use of the charities uh, to encourage self-management. Um, all of the resources that I'll be talking about um, in the next minute or two are accessible via the HMSA website in the professional section. And we're trying to make it widely available so that people can actually use what's there and take away some of our resources uh, to do your own presentations uh, and spread the word that way. And it's based around a masterclass program which started uh, going back five years now in Kent. And um, what is fascinating about these masterclasses is, is how, how um, people attend and actually really walk away with uh, a, a sort of clearer view of this unfolding story. And it's, it's great to see the pennies drop as people understand, and GPs in particular, yes. realizing that they're looking after patients um, that they're scratching their heads about, but suddenly it falls into place when you, when you put this Absolutely. knowledge together. Yeah. Absolutely. And we've, um, we've spoken together, haven't we, a couple of, um, well, online, we've been around the country yes. in a couple of places, and I've come down to Kent as well. Yes. Um, where you organised a masterclass there. Um, so it's really fabulous how you're, you're getting out there and helping, as you say, educate people who are working on the front line. So That's it's brilliant. 
That, that's right. And of course, this year, um, not being able to do live masterclasses, uh, which are the sort of gold standard, um, yeah. we've, at the HMSA, we've, we've done uh, two masterclasses um, that, that cover a, a wide range of uh, issues. And they're, they're probably the most up to date uh, at this point in time. Uh, and uh, that will be uh, on the website as well, the videos uh, from those masterclasses, which have included expert uh, speakers, um, both uh, um, doctors and uh, health professionals and expert patients. So we're very excited about that. Yeah, very good. I thought it would be worth just reminding ourselves about the consequences of diagnostic delay, um, which is really the most frustrating aspect of trying to practice as a hypermobility yeah. specialist at the moment. Patients have been going around in circles, sometimes for years. When we did a survey at the HMSA going back a few years now, the diagnostic delay can be 10 years and, and, and people are just completely misunderstood. Uh, there are wasted GP consultations, wasted hospital appointments, unnecessary medication and all the side effects that go with that. And the patient ends up quite frequently with no diagnosis, feels in limbo and actually becomes uh, unwell as a result of the lack mm -hmm. of diagnosis and appropriate treatment. So what we're saying here uh, as part of this process is it's time to do something different. I, I know we've been saying that for a long time now, mm -hmm. but it definitely the time has arrived. Yeah. Um, so within the professional section of the hmsa website we've got four sections we've got the aims the background information and the resources and the next step um, in the resources section we've got everything you need to do we call it a meeting in a box uh, everything you need to do to take away to do your own meetings and help spread the word it's free to you uh, the next steps um, include um, a paper that i wrote um, including guidance for commissioners um, in, and and we, we, we hope in Kent to get that adopted. Um, but as you know, in, 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 in the commissioning process has been uh, uh, upside down over the last, uh, since lockdown. So we, we're, we're still working on that. Um, so you'll get to the, um, the, the web pages. Uh, this is a, a previous website, but gives you an idea. You'll find my smiley face there. Mm -hmm. And the new HMSA website will be launched uh, in 2022 uh, with all the latest um, 2021 masterclasses available there. Fantastic, brilliant. Um, so um, just to let you know what to look out for, uh, I've mentioned meeting in a box, which has got uh, PowerPoint slides and handouts for your usage. Um, we're talking about how we create a multidisciplinary care web. Um, and the best video resources all in one place. So you'll find the 2017 HMSA um, EDS UK conference there. And we're pulling in um, uh, videos from other places uh, and links to them. So it's easy for you to, to find your way around. Um, so there are medical professional talks, there are patient management talks, patient stories from, from our own team as well as others. And what we're trying to set up is uh, what we call the who's who locally, which is uh, people who've come to our masterclasses who we know are hypermobile friendly um, and therefore we can signpost in each area um, uh, to consultants who have really understood the message and allied health professionals. We can help with setting up local patient groups and also most importantly, and, and this is a message to you listening now, uh, help with the search for local champions. Each, each network, each county um, could have a local champion. It doesn't have to be uh, a consultant. It could be mm -hmm. an allied health professional. It could be yeah. an expert patient. Um, but we are looking for champions to help build up the network in each, each county. And we're also, as you know, very good at providing resources for patients, yeah. as are all the charities. Fabulous. That's really great. And so people can go to the HMSA website to learn more about all of this, can't they? Yes, um, that's the whole idea, yep. Fantastic, that's really, really good. Thank you so much for sharing that. And um, so yes, if you're interested in learning about any of this, head over to the HMSA website and, um, or get in touch with the HMSA and they will point you in the right direction. Fantastic. So we're also gonna talk about um, your observations that you've had on long COVID and um, the sort of the comorbidities that we're also quite aware of in this community. So 
I think you're going to share with us another presentation, aren't you, on long COVID? Yes, um, and um, yeah. this this is this is one that I presented to the Hypermobility Club yeah. back in October, um, yeah. and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Yes, and I saw that actually. I've already. Okay, so we're going to now have a look at this, as we said, the, um, the information that Dr. Bull has kind of been observing on long COVID. So thank you again, Dr. Bull, if you'd like to share, our, share your yeah. um, information with us. Okay, uh, so moving on, I've called this fibromyalgia fatigue and uh, long COVID. What, what do we know? And, and my, my heartfelt um, wish is that, that something good comes out of this pandemic in terms of those uh, individuals mm -hmm. in society who suffer from fatigue syndromes and of course yeah. um, hypermobility um, uh, and uh, fibromyalgia are closely related as we now know um, yeah. and um, I'd just like to sort of make a disclaimer that to, 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 I'm not an expert in dealing with post-COVID patients but I do have experience in managing patients with similar symptoms including fibromyalgia fatigue, hypermobility, dysautonomia and mast cell activation. And I am interested in knowing whether COVID is a trigger for symptomatic hypermobility. For example, by that, that I mean moving asymptomatic hypermobile patients into symptomatic mm -hmm. hypermobility. And whether yeah. uh, there are transferable skills from existing strategies that will help with management. I think uh, a lot of it's already on the shelf uh, and we know that, um, but I'm not sure that everybody knows that by any means. Yeah. So um, just going back to when I gave this talk, mm -hmm. I, I, I put the, uh, the figures uh, for in October in terms of uh, cases of uh, COVID. Um, of course, things have changed massively since that time. It's, a, it's an unfolding thing. But just to mm -hmm. remind us that, that um, uh, really we're, we're not, still not very well prepared for all of this, although uh, I think the vaccination program is, is standing us in good stead. The fact that we rolled out earlier and we're ahead of Europe. Um, yes. uh, but of course, you know, we still haven't got the right number of um, beds per person compared with um, Europe. And it, it's just a reflection on, on, on the weaknesses of the NHS. Um, but having said that, the incredible commitment that we have within the NHS and some very good people who are, are doing a, a, an amazing job during these difficult yeah. times. Um, I wanted to just yeah. reflect on um, Donald Rumsfeld uh, is an American politician and and he had a famous uh, quote which is about what we know and what we don't know yeah. and he was saying there were no knowns these are things that we know we know there are known unknowns that is to say there are things that we know we don't know and here we are in this new territory there are unknown unknowns uh, these are things that we don't know, we don't know. And I think it's always humbling just to reflect yeah. upon that because we're very much in that territory. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's unfolding. It's an unfolding story. Yeah. So uh, the questions, um, there are large, large numbers of long COVID um, it, it, patients in the UK. Um, it's a bizarre disease. Uh, and, and the other question is, how do we treat and recover from something we don't really understand? And how likely is total recovery? These are the big, big questions. And we don't even know what's, uh, you know, what the mechanism of causation for this condition. But what uh, we do, we, we do observe similarities to other conditions that we do recognise and starting to understand. Um, and that's largely what we are involved in, in, in telling the hypermobility story. So, yeah. you know, MCAS autonomic dysfunction, sorry, that's mast cell activation syndrome, autonomic dysfunction and fibromyalgia. Um, we've got um, a tentative handle on all of those in our day-to-day -day work. Yes. I wanted to just put this in perspective with other pandemics. Um, so with going back to when the SARS-1 pandemic uh, emerged, it was a more severe disease and 40% of those um, uh, patients had chronic fatigue after three years. Um, glandular fever has been around all the time for as long as I can remember. Um, symptoms tend to clear after a year, um, but immune dysregulation can persist for three years and then settle. But some people, I think we've all seen people who've had glandular fever who've been permanently changed by the uh, condition. I've certainly got one or two friends who've who've struggled with it uh, on a lifelong basis. So just to put this in perspective, with COVID-19, 
it seems, and, and this is a changing feast, 50% uh, may be better after three months, or it may take a, an 18-month course. And what is certainly true is many people are really struggling to get back to work mm -hmm. uh, or to, mm -hmm. to, to, to function anywhere near normality um, in the time course that we've been dealing with so far. Um, know, um, I had it in December last year, December 20, um, and I had the really, I already had chronic fatigue and POTS anyway, but they were exacerbated. Um, I think it took a good eight, nine months for it to settle and go back to where it was before. So it takes a long time. People have to be patient, I think, with it. You're absolutely right. That, that the, the data would, would support that entirely. Mm -hmm. And your personal experiences are really important. And I'll emphasize this whole issue of personal experiences uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in just a minute. Yes. Um, but the, the, uh, going back to August 2020, um, Trish Greenhouse, I'm sure that people are aware of these initial um, publications. Uh, that was um, a, a big one in the BMJ, but really highlighted, um, the, you know, the 50 most common long hauler symptoms and up there at the top, fatigue, mm. muscular aches and pains, uh, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, uh, brain fog, um, difficulty with exercise, headaches, etc. Um, a very familiar story uh, for those of us dealing with, um, with hypermobility as well. Uh, so breaking it down, I think it's important to understand that, that long COVID is not a homogeneous condition. Um, we see post-viral fatigue, we see mast cell activation, we see dysautonomia, exacerbation of existing intolerances and deficiencies, um, mental health, anxiety and depression, and endocrine system dysfunction. But in addition, uh, quite different to hypermobility syndromes is organ damage um, with the lungs, liver, kidneys and heart uh, being involved uh, in, a, in, in a very serious manner in some, in some patients. Yeah, yeah. There's also other facets um, of this, not only, you know, the things that I've mentioned already, but don't forget, uh, we're dealing also with post-ITU syndrome, uh, which can affect both the caregivers uh, who have to observe their loved ones on the mm -hmm. ICU or and not, not yeah. with any ease during the uh, pandemic, of course, yeah. access to seeing your loved ones is severely limited. And then the survivors um, who have a, uh, post-ITU syndrome, uh, which can affect mental health, cognitive dysfunction, as well as the physical impairments. Um, so a lot to think about here with these different facets. I've never heard I of that, Dr. Ball, that IT. Is that because of the stress of being in ITU? Yeah, yep, yes. Oh. It's, it's, a, it's a defined syndrome in itself, post-ITU oh. syndrome, yeah. Wow. So I, I, a minute ago, I just mentioned to you the power of um, uh, talking to patients, hearing patient mm -hmm. story. And Gez Medinger, who is a, is a, um, a, a film producer, uh, has his own channel. It's called Run DMC. Nothing to do with um, uh, that famous band. Um, mm -hmm. But he has, uh, with that, um, uh, got lots of informative interviews with uh, experts um, uh, and um, people involved in dealing with long COVID and has done recovery surveys and has got information out much more quickly than the traditional um, medical publication peer reviewed journals can do uh, from long COVID support groups um, and other uh, Twitter, for example. And uh, I just raised this as, as a, a useful point of reference because this is where I've learned from my patients by listening to them and they're looking at stuff like this. Uh, I think Gez has taken a very a very balanced uh, view and has done his own surveys on quite large numbers of people. So I, I just wanted to mention that because it's it, with with social media, we're looking at a different way of getting information out. Um, some of which um, may be highly uh, highly relevant and and valid. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing which uh, came out in October, and you, you, you'll be aware of the Zoe app um, and Professor Tim Spector and the work that he's done uh, by gathering all this information through the Zoe app on an international basis. Um, and he started off this, this, this uh, update um, in December, in October, just uh, 
bringing out the new definition from the World Health Organization, which is post-COVID-19 condition, it's now called, not, not long COVID. Okay. I'm not sure how, how that will be caught on, but that's the official uh, title. Yes. Uh, and it's linked to probable COVID infection. In other words, you know, there are lots of people in the early days who did not get a positive test. Um, and we, the WHO does not want that group of patients to be excluded from getting appropriate care or, or uh, diagnosis. So yeah. um, linked to probable COVID infection, you, know, you do not have to have a positive test to, to have this uh, diagnosis. Um, uh, and it, uh, they're saying lasts more than three months. And the point is that it can be fluctuant. These symptoms can come and go. So you, you're, you're feeling terrible one day and then you might go through a period of feeling a bit better and then it comes back again. And the important thing is that this set of uh, observations is not explained by other conditions. Yeah. Moving on to prevalence, um, the Office of National Statistics have said that 3 to 12% of um, COVID patients may get long COVID. In other yeah. words, large numbers. And, and so yeah. it's going to be highly relevant to all of us in dealing with this um, uh, ongoing. Uh, how many still suffering a year? A very great amount of uncertainty around this particular question, but um, Tim Spector's team were saying that the, the first wave um, were mostly getting better. Um, and yet a lot of those people were still struggling to get back to work. Yeah. So the risk factors for long COVID, uh, higher age, female, um, going back to the acute phase, if you have more than five symptoms in the first week, then that seems to predispose if you're overweight. Um, and apparently um, diet influences the severity of the COVID, uh, acute COVID. I think that, that is well established, but we're not sure about whether it influences um, uh, long COVID. Um, and there's an unpredictability here. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no information about the menopause um, and... Uh, Tim Spector made the point that uh, under-reporting in males may affect analysis uh, of what data there is because men do not tend to come forward uh, yeah. for whatever reason so, so readily and accurately in relation yeah. to symptomatology. So the other, next question um, in terms of what's causing it, is it an autoimmune disease? And I think it's fair to say that it doesn't look or behave like other classical autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid or lupus. Um, uh, there are skin changes, um, there are publications on that, I'm not going to go into detail here on that, but um, the COVID toe uh, is, a, is a, a unique phenomenon, yeah. again still at this stage not fully understood, uh, but it's not looking thing. like um, vasculitis or uh, one, yeah. one of those um, uh, classical autoimmune diseases, but it's an unfolding uh, mm -hmm. an unfolding a uh, picture and autoimmunity will undoubtedly play a part uh, in this this whole process yeah so just to summarize the the roundup of, of acute covid symptoms um backache uh, you know so many people uh, complain of of backache uh, at the time of onset joint, joint ache flu-like mm -hmm. symptoms the characteristic changes in taste and smell um, people feeling out of it um, people feeling like they've been steamrolled. These are these are quotes from patients. Tinnitus, yeah. post-exertional malaise, headaches, chest pains, and all of these different symptoms have different cycles. Um, so you might get any combination of these coming and going uh, through the acute phase. Um, and what Tim was saying about the Zoe app is that patients with logging symptoms helps to identify progress. And, and that, I think, is also uh, true for our community of hypermobile yes. patients, making a note of what's happening. Yes. yes. So I'm going to move on to treatments and approaches that have been tried and that we should perhaps uh, recommend. But pacing is very important. Um, vaccination undoubtedly reduces the risk of long COVID by 50% from the ZOE study. Um, I would say go slow to go faster. Uh, you know, if you try and rush it, try to get back to your usual exercise regime, it's just not going to happen. No. If you're lucky. No. I found that out myself. <laughs> I tried to go back to doing all my normal exercise and it just did not work. I had to be patient. I really did. 
Yeah, I think this is really important, and, and particularly in the workplace, that, that, that we have to realign the uh, yeah. expectations for employers, although I don't think it's happening quickly, but um, mm -hmm. that's very important. So uh, COVID cl clinics have been set up. Um, it wait, we, we need to wait to see exactly um, you know, how effective um, they are, because I'm not sure that they've got the templates in place at the moment to to give the full knowledge, for example, of what we uh, understand with, with rehab, but, but at least they've been set up, there's a place for patients to go. Um, then of course we could recommend antihistamines, I'm sure that's going to help um, uh, patients with mast cell activation. Statins seem to be helpful. There's lots of things that have been thrown up, but statins, um, and, and there are studies uh, going ahead uh, to mm -hmm. establish uh, this on a you know, proper footing. Uh, mm -hmm. Hyperbaric oxygen has been tried. Uh, apheresis, this is a process of filtering the blood um, for good for conditions where particulates um, are circulating. You want to get them out of the system to uh, improve the homeostasis, mm -hmm. but uh, questionable, I think. Um, learning to listen to our patients with their endeavours and, and what that tells us. Everyone's going to be different. Everyone will find something that they believe has helped them. And, and, and I think by listening to that, it's going to be really important. Yeah. No doubt that we should avoid alcohol. Um, uh, and then I mentioned above the trials on statins, aspirin and antihistamines, which are in place at the moment. Um, mm. And I think Tim was making the point, and I entirely agree, um, that it remains difficult to get the help you need, uh, along with many other long-term conditions, just like the hypermobility syndromes. You know, yeah. people aren't able to get it. It, it. it is, I think it is the knowledge within the charities that's leading the way here. Yeah, amazing. Um, so word about vaccination. Um, if you've had COVID, uh, you'll get strong protection from previous infection, 64%. Um, but that compares with 90% from, from vaccination. And um, of course, we're now into the phase of, of the boosters. So uh, I don't have information on that, but uh, I've had my booster and yeah. everyone else should, I think, uh, without doubt. Um, so dr vaccination dramatically reduces the possibility of long COVID. That's really important to take on board. Yeah. Um, and when there, there was a, a study uh, a observation uh, from the long COVID SOS group, um, mm -hmm. more people uh, with uh, long COVID improved uh, with, uh, with vaccination, some, some deteriorated and had side effects from the vaccine. So yeah. a bit of a mixed bag there in terms of, um, but without doubt, uh, it is best to get vaccinated. The worst aspect of COVID is getting long COVID, uh, assuming that you survive um, the initial infection. So getting long COVID is, is bad news. Um, and the best advice is don't get it in the first place by doing whatever you can to minimize your risk. Um, and and that, that is, is, is paramount. Yeah. So what might we suggest? So um, diet, um, there's big question marks about whether low histamine diet is actually practically uh, worthwhile, <clears throat> but it's mm. certainly something you can identify things that don't suit you. <laughs> Antihistamines if MCAS is suspected. No alcohol. Stop exercising in the short term and eventual return to exercise. Yeah. Expect relapses and take rest when you need it. Patient needs to reassess their expectations. Don't rush back to work. Make reasonable adjustments. Phased reintroduction, which may be slower than your employer would ideally hope for. Yeah. Support groups can be helpful. Yeah. And social media surveys and patient experience uh, can be uh, useful for getting uh, getting ideas. But obviously, it has to be taken uh, in in context um, and and um, uh, not. Uh, not get false hope from something uh, which may be um, just an individual comment rather than peer, peer group reviewed um, yes. sort of research. It is very interesting though, isn't it? Because it's all those recommendations are exactly the same as we'd give anyone who has hypermobility syndromes. And this, yes. is, this, this is it. Um, and that's where I think as, as um, 
a group of uh, enthusiasts and uh, with great core knowledge, uh, we, we've got something to bring to the table. Mm-hmm. If somebody would, uh, you know, listen to what we yes. what we are observing, um, so uh, I think uh, I think it'll become clearer um, as things unfold that we've actually got something very important to 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 bring yeah. into the COVID clinic, the post COVID well, clinic. Must do. We must do. I mean, we have mm-hmm. so much experience in working with these with this community. Um, and it's really interesting on the mast cell. You know, I've, I took antihist- I take antihistamines anyway for my mast cells. So um, I do wonder if that helped. I didn't get COVID very badly. I do wonder if that helped. I don't know. Yes. I don't know. But. Yeah. Well, I think, I think um, funnily enough, when it comes to the vaccinations, um, uh, I'm, a, I'm advising many of my patients uh, to take an antihistamine before they go mm-hmm. for the yeah um, that makes that makes good sense um, mm. um so um yeah similarities between hypermobility syndromes and possible transferable skills so let's just uh, let's just move on to look at mm. that shall we yeah um, uh you'll be familiar with my uh iceberg slide um and that's just to remind us about all of the things that, that go unnoticed with hypermobility under the water um mm. And of course, the, the classification um, that um, you know is most of you will be familiar with. On the left, the asymptomatics, ten percent, fifteen percent of society, and on the right, uh, the rare stuff, and in between, uh, hypermobility spectrum disorder and hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, um, which is what most of us uh, deal with on a day-to-day basis. Um, and I think the point about this slide is that it is going to be likely that asymptomatic hypermobiles do get pushed into symptomatic hypermobility uh, if they contract COVID. But I haven't, mm. can't prove that yet, but it seems likely. Mm. Mm, very interesting. Now, um, like any kind of um, condition, uh, it's helpful if you break it down. And Jane Simmons um, spider, um, mm helps us with this in hypermobility, breaking it down into the eight components. Um, Because patients come to me and they've got all this stuff wandering around up here and often uh, totally confused by the different aspects. So with this, um, uh, we are saying, think about each aspect and apply a methodology to to do that. Now with, with with, with long COVID, you've got um, uh, organ damage as another limb of this spider. Um, And that's a very serious aspect, uh, which might require input from a chest physician or a cardiologist if you've got um, cardiac involvement, et cetera, et cetera. But this is to help the patient organize their thinking. Um, This autonomia, I just remind you about the structure of the autonomic nervous system. Um, and the symptoms that we get with dysautonomia that we're all aware of uh, as hypermobility enthusiasts. Uh, So palpitations, dizziness, fainting, POTS, temperature control, sweating, bowels and and bladder uh, abnormalities. And then the the methodology, which I think we will be able to transfer, uh, pacing, increase your fluid intake, increase salt intake. And then of course, the medications I think are going to become important because many of these patients with long COVID have persistent tachycardia for months and months and months uh, and feel very potsy. So, um, you know, these kind of um, standard medications, and I know there's a lot lot longer list than that, but these standard uh, approaches uh, may well be the way forward for some uh, long COVID patients. So that's a transferable strategy. Um, And then with mast cell activation, which is all about histamine release, giving you flushing, dizziness, GI symptoms, brain fog, respiratory symptoms, and all of the standard uh, things that we hear. Um, There is a mast cell there loaded with histamine just waiting to release these, these, uh, the histamine into the circulation. So here is our sort of standard approach to mast cell activation. Um, low histamine diet and as I've said it's a bit complicated I think we're moving away from that but if you if you if you if you find something that works for you then obviously omit it so 
into antihistamines, try several over the counter, and then you're moving into fexofenadine and the other ones. And okay. then into the safe and standard strategies, uh, similar to that for asthma with um, chromoglycate montelukast. And then of course, there is a host of vitamins um, being suggested that are important in this pathway. Um, probably worth considering some of these, um, uh, yeah. but worth following the evidence as it emerges. And one of the things I learned recently was um, mast cells uh, life cycle is six months. So once they're sensitized, it will take a long time, uh, even if you take away the triggers uh, for the effect uh, to wear off if you get it under control. So just bear that in mind. It's not something where you take a medication and suddenly you're yes. fixed. It's not quite that simple. No, no, no. I thought I'd bring ourselves close to the end here with talking about my approach to fibromyalgia and hypermobility, which is to listen carefully and give people time. That's the single most valuable thing. I, I'm very lucky in the private sector, I give patients up to an hour. In the NHS, you're lucky to get half an hour. So bear that in mind when, when you see your NHS rheumatologist, they, they are up against it with the expectations as are the therapists in the NHS. Yeah. Investigate appropriately. Make sure we're not missing, missing something. Excuse me. I then move on to a detailed physio assessment to identify mechanical factors. And I've actually um, uh, contributed to the latest um, HMSA journal uh, with a summary of which therapist to give you some ideas mm. about what the different therapists actually do. Yeah. Really, you'll find that interesting. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to say, is the hypermobility relevant to these symptoms? And if it is, you can attribute most of the symptomatology to that diagnosis. Medication review is important. Most medications don't work with hypermobility syndromes, particularly in terms of pain. Mm. Probably the most important thing I do is to validate symptoms and give a workable explanation. And then I move on to um, things like Alexander Technique lessons and mindfulness um, as part of uh, the treatment uh, process. And the right type of exercise is important. Um, aqua aerobics, Tai Chi, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But then moving on for empathic follow-up with guidance and taking a holistic approach to the usual sort of things like pacing and sleep. Yeah. So just to show a piece of evidence, um, this was a BMJ study, Tai Chi for fibromyalgia, and it showed that it was more effective than aerobic exercise. So this is a, a very easy to access um, modality of treatment. Um, I appreciate not all of our patients can stand up or sort of steady doing Tai Chi exercises, but uh, it's important to know that it's out there and it can mm. be effective. The yeah. Alexander Technique, it has evidence base uh, for helping with neck pain and lumbar pain and is also very mindful and yeah. helps you move differently. So we're talking about um, if, if you were a, a car, uh, and the physiotherapist was your mechanic, the Alexander teacher is like a driving instructor teaching you to move mm. differently. Yeah. And then there's the third component, of course, um, which is uh, movement therapy, um, which um, Jeannie, you're an expert in mm -hmm. uh, and a protagonist, of course. Yeah, yeah. But they're so all I've... sort of, um, you know, Tai Chi, Alexander, movement therapy, or my movement therapy, they're all very calming, aren't they? They have Absolutely. similar traits to them. And I think that's really important. And I, I believe that in down, down, down regulating the central nervous system yes. is key to exactly. the management of pain. And I, all of these modalities help. Yes. Um, and you, you, you mentioned at the beginning that I'm a mindfulness um, mm. uh, champion. Uh, and I think I've, I've moved on uh, in some ways to a, a different modality uh, because sometimes the mindfulness isn't enough um, and some people really struggle with trying to get into it but um, mm -hmm. this new um, uh, modality of mindful self-compassion um, which has uh, been put together with Kristin Neff and Christopher Germer in America and it combines mindfulness with um, self-kindness recognizing our common humanity um, and 
being less self-critical. Uh, and I, I would mm -hmm. commend it to you uh, in terms of part of what I think is, is really key. Um, so firstly, the physiotherapy, secondly, the mental health, and mm -hmm. thirdly, uh, the fitness elements, uh, which yeah. is where, where the um, Zebra Club uh, is a good example. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to mention that the total um, approach really is is a multiplicity, the multidisciplinary care web, which is outlined on the, on this slide. Uh, and you can see on the right um, that you could present to almost any specialist with hypermobility. Yeah. Um, but we're putting the patient at the center of this care web and the GP very close. It's very important to get a good relationship going with your GP and to utilize uh, his network, uh, his or her network um, with, for example, in Kent, the community pain team have now become very skilled at managing hypermobility and have done um, uh, training uh, with the Earl of Stanlos um, Society um, program mm -hmm. um, and have come to our master classes and, and a safe place for patients to go. And that may well be that the community pain team is, is a good target for us for our master classes in the future. Yes. Um, it's all there. Recently, of course, we've got the schools uh, program uh, from EDS UK and HMSA. That's very helpful information yeah. uh, for patients, uh, for, for, for teachers alike. Yes. The school toolkit, isn't it? It's very good. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So um, we have a handout at uh, the end of each of the, the masterclasses and talks that I do, and it's here, and you can download it from, from the website. And yep. thank you all for listening. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing everything with us. That was really, really interesting. Um, I think we've all probably learned a lot there. A lot to think about, isn't there, with all that long COVID information? There but is. It is amazing, the similarities, isn't it, with what we're dealing with every day. It's just yes. phenomenal. So, yeah. Yes, we could definitely help, I think. with the I'm, I'm, I'm sure we can. And it's a question of getting our voice heard in the right places. Yes. Um, yeah. That's what we're on to now. Yeah. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. So, um, and I hope everyone listening appreciated and learned something new from uh, Dr. Ball's presentations. Um, and as we said earlier, if you want to learn any more or you know, look into anything, please visit the HMSA website. Um, and as Dr. Ball said, you can download these, um, these leaflets or you can get in touch um, on any of the topics that um, were discussed today. So thank you again to our guests. And thank you everyone for listening and until next time, keep moving. Bye.